thank you for joining us for today's webinar, An Introduction to Microsoft Teams. It is anything but business as usual these days, and we hope that you're all hanging in there during these very challenging times. With so many businesses transitioning to working from home, we thought that it would be helpful to offer a webinar in Microsoft Teams, especially since so many of you already have access to Teams as part of your Office 365 toolbox. So within a week's time, we put together this presentation with the hope that it will help you improve collaboration with your coworkers and also help you to communicate with your customers while you're working from home. Just wanna say a quick few words about Kite Technology. So many of you joining us today are not current clients and may not be familiar with us. Kite Tech is a managed IT services provider and consulting firm. We provide comprehensive technology management to small and mid-sized businesses to help them maximize performance and operate more securely. We support organizations in many different industries, including but not limited to independent insurance agencies, nonprofits, and many other professional organizations. Kitech has been around for more than 28 years, and today we support more than 3,000 end users across the United States. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Kitech's president and founder, Jeff Kite. Jeff, it's all yours. Thanks, Eleni, and welcome everyone. Really appreciate you being here for this webinar. Uh, today's audience is a combination of both clients and also others who have responded to our invitation, and all are welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, Adam Atwell will be helping with this uh, presentation today. Uh, Adam and I have been friends for a long time and working together for more than eight years, and I'm looking forward to his presentation as well. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to um, talk about these times that we're in, uh, definitely strange times. And because of that, it's causing us to work differently. In fact, this webinar was really born from our own experiences with Teams as it became a central hub for us in much of our internal communication and our meetings with clients and in many other ways. Uh, last week, as we noticed our clients were beginning to think about or beginning to send workers home, uh, it occurred to us that uh, Teams might really help. And so that's the reason we put this webinar together. So let's shift now and take a look at the agenda of what we're gonna try to accomplish uh, today. Uh, we'll start with an overview. I'll handle that part of what is Microsoft Teams, what are the pieces to that puzzle, um, how to get it set up. Um, I'll touch on those things. Then we'll pivot to Adam. He's gonna do a full demo uh, of Microsoft Teams, many of the aspects of Teams uh, for you to see actual feature and function today. Uh, after that demo is finished, we'll have a time for questions and answers. And so while uh, Adam is doing his demo, feel free to send in some questions. Uh, Eleni already showed you how to do that through the control panel. And then we'll field as many of those questions as we have time for. And so uh, let's pivot now to uh, what is this thing called Microsoft Teams? So Microsoft Teams is a part of the Office 365 suite. So Office 365 uh, includes many pieces of this puzzle we're gonna call uh, Office, uh, Office 365. And so uh, there's uh, the apps, of course, Word, uh, Excel, and so on, um, hosted Exchange and OneDrive and, and uh, SharePoint, um, and Teams is a part of that as well. Uh, and so that's where Teams fits in as a part of the Office 365 suite. The Teams platform is an online communication platform. And what it provides is a number of things, really. Real-time chat, uh, which is texting uh, between uh, people in your organization. Um, it also provides an easy way to share documents, um, to support meetings uh, with clients. Uh, or with individuals in your team. And those meetings can even be uh, video uh, chat meetings. And so uh, the uh, Office 365 portal is really a starting place for getting into Teams, uh, but it also has a desktop application. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are mobile applications that can be installed on uh, Android and uh, Apple devices. So. Uh, let's go into more of the specifics now of just what it is that you need in order to get Microsoft Teams uh, up and running. And so uh, for that, we will start with the technical requirements. Um, Teams runs, as I mentioned, on a PC, uh, but also on a tablet or a smartphone. 
uh, and the PC operating systems uh, that it can work. Uh, Windows 10 or Mac operating system both have desktop applications that can be installed fully functional on the desktop. Um, in addition to that, uh, really audio is a core part of how Teams works. And so for that, you'll need speakers and a microphone. And if you really want to enhance the way meetings work, uh, even simple chats, <clears throat> then the use, <clears throat> excuse me, of a web camera really makes a difference. So the software that, that uh, makes this work, uh, the web browser is really a good starting point. And in fact, Adam's demo today is going to be entirely inside of the web browser. So we'll get to see the actual functionality and what that looks like operating teams inside of the web browser. Um, the browsers that are uh, compatible are uh, Microsoft's Edge, which is a part of the latest release of Windows 10, and also the Google Chrome browser, uh, and they work fine. In addition to that, as I mentioned, uh, the mobile applications for both Android and the Apple devices, and one of the really good things that Microsoft has done is they have incorporated a really a common look and feel across the different platforms, whether you're in a browser or in the application and whether that app is on a mobile device or um, in a, a PC environment. And so, uh, so that's sort of what the technical requirements are. Now let's pivot to what does it uh, take to license or acquire uh, Microsoft Teams. So as I mentioned, uh, it's part of the Office 365 system and there's a lot of different ways to purchase Office 365. Fundamentally, it's a monthly subscription to an offering from Microsoft, but there's a lot of different flavors. And so Teams is included with the versions of Office 365 that include cloud-based services. So that would include the business essentials and the business premium package, which is both hosted email and desktop applications. And then in addition to that, in the enterprise lineup, the E1, E3, E5, those are all enterprise versions or flavors of Office 365. And all five of those include cloud-based services, which is why Teams is included. It's important to understand that Teams is not part of the desktop application only versions of Office 365. And so that would include Office 365 Business and Pro Plus. Those are offerings with Office 365 that only provide for desktop applications, Word, Excel, Outlook, PowerPoint, you know what those are. Um, and I just wanna make one other quick note on this slide, and that is that um, there's an audio conferencing function within Teams, and that allows for call-in to meetings um, and other audio uh, functions. And uh, Adam's gonna cover that in more detail when he gets to uh, his presentation. And so uh, let's pivot now over to Adam. Uh, Adam, give us an idea of what all you're gonna cover inside of your demonstration. Thanks, Jeff. So on the screen here, we have uh, just the learning objectives. These are some of the goals at the high level that we hope to show you guys in the presentation. Uh, first and foremost, how do you get the Teams? How do you access it on the various devices that are supported? Um, after we cover that, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and go into uh, some of the core components of what it does, conducting a meeting, uh, chat, which is text chat, both with groups and individuals, and then how to call. And then I'll do a brief overview of the telephony features or things that correspond with dialing a phone number. That said, we'll move right into the demo. So the demo starts here on the Office 365 homepage. Most of you are probably familiar with this view. As Jeff mentioned earlier, Office 365 is made up of several different pieces. Some of those pieces are familiar to you from your desktop applications. Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. These are all apps that we've been using for years. As things have evolved with the Microsoft Office suite, we've started to see things like OneDrive and uh, OneNote evolve. And then more modern things for collaboration and remote workforces have centered around SharePoint teams and a couple of other things called Yammer, mostly for large corporations. That's a quick little, uh, quick little overview of kind of how things have evolved here. And now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna jump right into the Teams web experience. 
This is out of box ready and waiting for you if you already have a license. Clicking the Teams icon launches the Teams panel here. There are a couple of notes of interest in what you're, you're looking at. I'll start with the top and work my way around the screen. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see a familiar waffle. It's called the Microsoft Waffle, and that highlights other apps that you saw on your home screen. You can pin and resort those as, as you see fit. In addition to the waffle, you'll note there's a quick ability wherever you are in the application to go ahead and do a chat. Up top, front and center, we have the search command. And from here, you can search pretty much anything you've seen that's in text inside of Teams. Over to the far right, you'll notice a portrait. Uh, the, the picture here is just our demo tenant we've stood up for today. Megan Bowen, and from here you can do things like set your availability, status, and just kind of see your picture and make those adjustments. Also, easy access to downloading the app on the desktop or the mobile experience. Working our way around here to the left, you'll notice what's called the sidebar. And the sidebar, by default, is comprised of the icons you see, activity, chat, teams, calendar, calls, and files. Files is a pretty new one in the last year, so they really launched that and iterated it. Down here below, you'll also notice that there's apps, which takes you to the app store that you can add additional apps from third parties in, help menu for documentation, and then another quick link to download the desktop app. Going across the bottom over here to the middle, You'll see the area in which you can type in composed messages. We'll go into that in a few moments. And then lastly, notifications. So this is really important in terms of kind of managing your inputs, if you will, for a lack of better words. Um, I really try to control what notifications I have turned on because it's really easy to get inundated with notifications wherever they're coming from. For the demo today, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss these notifications and know that those notifications are really just dismissing Teams notifications inside of the Chrome browser experience here. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and go through the main core components that come here on the sidebar. So chat is probably the most used portion of this and where most folks jump right in and get started. You can see here from the chat screen once it's selected that you can see the recent pane and you can see this MOD administrator, which is just the demo tenant administrator account that we'll be chatting with today. Let's say hi, see if he's around. You'll notice here as we type, there's different ways to interact with the chat bubbles you see on the screen. You can use emoji icons and various reactions uh, to messages. You can even share the message and all kinds of other things translated if it was in a different language. Lots of options you'll find throughout the interface hidden in the triple dots. In addition to that, after you send a message, you can always edit it. So let's say that in 10, instead of trying to just say hi, I wanted to say, hey, are you there question mark question mark and send it along we'll wait to see if we get a response back but you'll also note it has a timestamp, and it also says that it was edited hey megan i am awesome mod administrator is here with us great in addition to the chat functionality you'll notice off to the upper right hand corner that we have buttons for video call and audio call We'll go into those towards the end of the overview. Over here, you can also see you can add people to chat. Clicking this button allows you to search the existing directory for other folks in your organization. Evidently, we don't have anyone named Matt. Maybe it's just me and Megan. I think everyone else must be sleeping. Beyond that, you'll also notice over here on the right, if you start to create more chats, they'll just follow in sequence here as more messages come in. Now these chat messages can be one person directly 
or they can go out to multiple parties. So inside the chat here, we can go ahead and say, Megan, actually we're already chatting with her, so that won't work. And actually no one else is online, so we won't be able to chat with multiple parties. But I think you get the, the point here of you can continue to chat with multiple groups of people. This area is really often referred to as private messaging or direct messaging. Microsoft likes to use different words and then rebrand things to make it confusing and keep us on our game. All that being said, as you get messages, you'll see the history build up here. We'll take a moment now and go ahead and review what the call features look like um, by making the call. I'll go ahead and just start an audio call. And on the other end, we sh well, hopefully we'll get a response. There we have the mod administrator waving and saying hello. And you'll also notice that there are a couple of other features that we can highlight here. So right now, that's actually Jeremy, just in case you guys didn't know. He's one of our employees here at Kite Tech. He went ahead and turned on the blur background feature, which is a really great feature to kind of keep the meeting free from distractions. In addition to that, there are other toggles here front and center. You could turn the camera on. That's the camera from your side. You'll also notice the call duration and that's increasing over time. There's of course the traditional mute button. And then here there's a share screen. Within the share screen, you can see we have other things that we can share. And these are a couple of PowerPoint documents that I have up, up inside of my Office 365 account here. Under more actions, you'll find device specific settings. So if we go there to device settings, we can see that we can adjust which microphone we're using, which speaker we're using, and what camera we're using. In addition to that, we can keep private viewing on. This will limit the ability for folks to share things on their end. So if you really want to be the one who's sharing the content, be it um, the video screen or you know an actual PowerPoint document to multiple parties, this will control that setting. Closing out of the device settings and going back down here to the triple dots, you'll also notice a couple of other options. You can enter full screen if you want to see just that complete view, just the person you're talking to. So this is great for like conference rooms where you just want to have that interaction with the end user you're speaking to or multiple parties there for a conference meeting. In addition to full screen, you can also do things like hold. We'll take a moment and place Jeremy on hold if uh, there was another call that came in, for instance, or we wanted to just take a moment and then come back. We'll go ahead and come on back to the call. And then in addition to that, we can also see here that we can do a couple of other things like consult, then transfer. So what does that mean? That's kind of like a transfer to someone's extension, if you will, in the telephone terms, but it's a video call. So I could transfer Jeremy to someone else. Could also get a keypad and that is really tied to telephony required features. Um, and that does tie to additional licensing and uh, dollars cost there. And then there's start recording and end recording if we had started it. We can also turn off the incoming video if we want to control the video there that we have on the other end. That's what that looks like. Lastly, over here on the side, you'll notice that we can show the conversation that we already were having with Jeremy. And so we'll continue that conversation here and I'll actually put the video back on so you guys can see the picture and have the experience a little bit better. How do you think things are going? And we'll see what the administrator says here. And you can see the chats coming in line. While that message is coming through, you'll notice some of these other fun sidebar options. Uh, there's attachments. If you want to throw a document up that you're sharing, of course, fun stuff like emojis. And then, of course, GIFs for all the random internet memes in the world, if that's your thing.
All right, we'll go ahead and say bye to Jeremy, and that's going to be the highlight of what we wanted to show on the live call. Thanks for being here, Jeremy. Take care. Actually, hold on one second, Jeremy. I just want to highlight one other thing, and it's this Add Participants button. So a lot of times what we do here at Kite Tech is we'll be having a meeting, and then we'll say, hey, let me get somebody else involved in this conversation, and then we'll just go ahead and search and dial them straight into the meeting. That was the last thing I wanted to show there. So we're good to sign out. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care. After every single call, Microsoft is constantly surveying you to ask how the quality was. And so I try to provide some feedback where I can here because ultimately it's going to help us out. So we'll do that, send that feedback, and then off we go and we're back to the chat experience. Now you'll notice here right in the midst of the chat panel, you can see that the chat that Jeremy and I had during that call is all visible right here. So that's great. In addition to that, you can also see that off to the side, we still have the same features of adding people. Now, if we went and added someone else to the chat, we would have the ability to decide whether or not we wanted to share the history of this chat, or if maybe we only wanted to share the last day or so. Because we only have a single person here in the demo environment, we can't properly demonstrate that feature on demand, but I'm sure you get the idea there. That's primarily what we wanted to go through here in terms of chat, and just to recap, the chat function is ready to roll, ready for you to work with, both for single direct message chats or for chats with groups of people. And you can just add those here for a new chat. So that covers new chat. Next, we're gonna move down to the Teams area. The Teams area you can see here brings a whole new navigation pane off to the left-hand side. And this view, I'm gonna try to simplify for explanation's sake. You can see here on the left, there are three groups here listed, one called CONSCO, another called X1050 Launch Team, and then another called Business Development. Now, what are these things? They're teams, actually. And so inside teams, you can have teams. I know you're probably confused because I know I got confused already, but you got to try to stick with all the multiple word use that Microsoft uses here. So let's kind of go through these teams and talk about what we have here. Before we dive in, let's take a look at what different types of teams there are. I'll do that by clicking the join team button and walking through the GUI to create a new team. We're gonna build a team from scratch for a visual here. And you can see here, this is a good representation of the three different types of teams. At the bottom, you can see one called OrgWide, where everyone in your organization will automatically be joined to the team. Now you'll notice over in the pre-built team in the demo, we do have an OrgWide team. It's the Consco team there at the top. In addition to that, you have public teams. Public teams are there and they're searchable and anyone can join them at any time. Private teams actually need permission, permission to join. So you need to be invited by the team administrator or you need to request access. We're gonna go back now and kind of review the team panel itself and we'll start out with this main org wide team. So you'll notice here that just by default inside of the team, there's a channel this word general is what a channel is. There's a channel here called general. And for every single one of our teams, there is a general channel. So by default, you get the general channel in every single team. You'll also notice that off on the right-hand side, it shows you an indicator of what kind of team it is, just in case you forgot. So the general channel of the Consco team is an org wide channel and team and everyone can have access to it. If we click down here to the general channel on the launch team, you can see here, this is indicated as a regular team. Now, 
it's a public team, excuse me. The icon is really hard to see, but there's a picture of an eyeball there, and that's showing you that it's not private, but it's available for anyone that's inside of the X1050 launch team. In addition to that, you can go down to the general section in the business development team and see that this team is a public team as well. Let's go inside here and take a look inside of the X1050 launch team to understand what this layout structure looks like. So below, you can see that you have channels within the team. Again, the general channel is there by default, but you see a couple of other channels that are showing us some notifications, one called design, one called digital assets web, go to market plan, legal and compliance, and web and social trends. From here, you can organize conversations, files, and other types of messages in their respective sub channels. From here, let's go to the design channel and we'll note that there already was some conversation happening. Inside the conversation, there was a couple of meetings that got created. Also, you can see here that it supports inline replies for certain messages that folks say. So the message Johanna is, is saying the quick sync with UX is here and other folks are responding specifically to that thread. And we'll keep scrolling down. So this is the general posts area inside of the channel itself. Now, let's just take a minute to kind of sync that in and recap it, because it's a lot of information to digest at once. So you can see here that, again, we're inside of a channel and posts within that channel. Well, why not just come over here and send a direct message to one of the parties that are in that channel itself? If we do that, then we won't see that that channel gets the information and shares it with all the other team members that are a part of that team. So short version, conversations that are relevant to the X50 team launch design aspects are relevant to have here and organize here rather than in direct messages. I think you'll find that for most things, making use of the channels for conversations is a really good idea. In addition to that, you'll also notice inside of each of the channels, there are a couple of extra tabs here. Those tabs can be unique based on each of the channels you're in. I'll go ahead and add a tab to the go to market channel so you can get an idea of what's here. Clicking add brings up the tab browser experience where you can search. It's taking a moment here, I'm sure because of the load we have on it. There we go. Um, the website is the one that I'm going to preview here and I'll just go ahead and type the Kitec Group website and I'll add that as a tab and I'll post to the channel that I added this to the tab so they'll see it. Once I save that, you'll notice that if we go back to the postings area, we can see that a user added a website that they want us to have our attention focused on or for reference. And in, in addition to that, I can easily access the tab and browse it right inside the screen. That's just a quick demo of what you can see in terms of tabs. And there's lots of creative ways that you can actually interact with those things. Moving down here, you can also see a couple of extra options that maybe you didn't before. One of the icons is the Meet Now button. Now this Meet Now is a live meeting that it would call all of the members that are a part of this team. Now, obviously, we're not gonna do that here because we only have one other person, the administrator, and they're taking their lunch break. But I think you get the idea if you needed to call an all staff meeting, you could do that very fast with the meet now button. That's an overview of the posting area inside. 
let's go and take a preview and look at maybe a couple of these other tabs here. Files is probably one of the most practical tabs here that you can take a look at. A lot of times within a within a group inside our, your organization, you may find that you have a common set of documents. Those documents could be PDFs where you just reference them and always share them out with your customers, or they could actually be documents that you want to collaborate on together. Here I'm just going to open up and quickly demo what one aspect of editing a document could look like. Inside of the Teams web app experience, I'm inside of the Documents tab and I op opened up this document inside of Excel. Now you'll notice it's a scaled down version of the full featured Excel experience, but for anyone that's used Excel on the web, you probably know that it's great for quick edits. So you can make those changes and then go ahead about your day. And then once you're done in the upper right hand corner, you can go ahead and close the message. Also, you'll find that maybe sometimes you're working with other folks, excuse me, and they want to let you know, hey, don't go ahead and edit that cell. I'm already working on this document. Give me a few minutes. You could actually start a conversation here if you notice someone else was editing. So that's just a quick aside for document and document editing inside of the Teams experience. Wiki, I'm sure you guys have all heard the term, but it's fundamentally, you know, a website, a website that's live in the background that's associated with this channel. And you can do this in many, many different ways. You can tailor that to meet your needs. All right, so we reviewed the three different types of teams that you can create. And I'll just go back here quickly to point it out again. Um, you can go ahead and you can have the org-wide team, which to recap again, there is a default org-wide team that you are automatically enrolled in for every new team's instance. There's public orgs that you can join, and then there's private that you need permission to join. We're going to actually go ahead and create, create a private private team so you can see what that experience looks like. So the, the most famous private team I can think of that you see all the time in these examples is management. Management and the description is we make all the right choices. We'll go ahead and create that. Once you do that, you'll notice the next step in the interface is telling you a good job. It's always positively encouraging you. And we'll go ahead and add one person. That's the mod administrator. And you'll notice that after we add someone to the team, we have the ability to give them different privileges of owner or member. Most folks are going to have membership rights. And typically, you can think of the owner as someone who would moderate the content for that respective team. We'll make the mod administrator a member. And then we can see here in the main general channel post that the mod administrator was added to this team. In addition to that, you can go in later and manage the channel and go ahead and make some changes here as to moderation and what they can do. And then I'll go one step further, which is adding people or removing people and in here in the manage the team section. Also, you can see the members and guests there. So that's a quick overview of kind of how to manage the, the team membership, if you will. I'm going to take one other dive, and that's really to kind of see what's out there. Um, already, we're, we're a member of all of these various teams. Now, let's say that I just wanted to leave the business development team because I'm no longer a part of the team. And so I'm the owner of the team, so of course I can't leave it. My apologies. If we join a team, over here, what you would see is an option for joining a public team that you're not a member of right here on this screen. 
unfortunately i'm a member of all of the teams so i can't really leave them and i own them all so that's a that's a quick overview of the teams button we're going to Go ahead and move on over to the calendar now. And inside the calendar here, you can see a very familiar view of what you might see as the work week view in Outlook. Outlook, excuse me. From here, you can make adjustments to day view, work week, or just the regular full week. Sometimes that work might fall into the weekends. We'll put it back on the work week view just for a visual sake. At the top, you'll notice over here on the left, you have the today function. And if for some reason you got ahead of yourself all the way out into April or May, maybe when things hopefully settle down a little bit around here, um, you know, and look for that vacation, right? Let's say maybe we just want to take that day off. And so May 13th is close enough to my birthday that I think I'm going to try to take a day off. I'll go ahead and fill that out here and call it the personal day. I don't need to invite anybody to it because it's really just for me. But you'll notice there are a couple of other familiar things you see, like you would in Outlook. So you have the day, you have the time, you have the duration, all day meeting, your recurrent settings. You even have things like location and channel. You could tie the meeting to a channel itself. And then of course you have notes like you're used to sending. If you wanted to go ahead and add someone else to the meeting, you could use the scheduling assistant to do that. And going over here, you'll be able to see their calendar. Hopefully most of these calendar related functions are familiar in that you've used them in Outlook before. I'll go ahead and send a meeting invite there just to make sure that I get that personal day. At some point, the administrator might accept the fact that I'm taking the day and we'll go from there. But if not, I'll probably take the day off anyway. Well, let's get back to March. Here we are at March 26th and it looks like I'm all up to date with what's going on. But I do have this meeting over here. I'll check into that in a minute. I'm not really too worried about it right now. Let me make sure I told you guys about the rest of this stuff up here. So there's a meet now button and you could pretty much start a private meeting on demand similar to other areas here and go ahead and come up with who you want to you know, have that meeting with on demand. In addition to that, you could create a new meeting. Live events, something that's more of a broadcast to the whole organization. We're not gonna cover that in any detail today but that functions there as well. And then one of the other things that we frequently see is that folks want to create meetings where they might want to extend an invitation to someone that's outside their organization. So somebody like, for instance, your customer, or maybe even, you know, your customer's customer. So you'll notice here that I received an invite um, called the Teams Webinar Post Review. And if I open that up, you can see the contents of that meeting have some information here. The top link that says join Microsoft Teams meeting. First of all, this, this invite actually came from myself. I sent this invite here to Megan's account. And I have what's called the Teams conference license, the audio conferencing license. That's the one that Jeff mentioned earlier. It's an extra $4 per user per month. So that means I can organize meetings all by myself. And when I do that, everyone who gets an invite to the meeting gets the call in and the conference ID. If for some reason you, you know, need to pull somebody in or they're calling in from the road, the conference bridge is definitely the best way to go. I think you'll find that for most of your organizations, you may need a license or two, but not everyone needs to have the conference license. I want to remind you of the link here up top to join Microsoft Teams meeting. And what that'll do is that'll prompt the users on the other end to download the Microsoft Teams app once they connect with it. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are asking, well, what if I send someone an invite via email to a Microsoft Teams meeting and I don't have a conference bridge, can they join the meeting? The answer is yes. So you can extend an invitation to a Teams video meeting or a Teams audio only meeting 
just through the link of the Teams app here in the calendar invite. There's no additional licensing required on the guests that you've invited and no cost to them. They just join the meeting and then they can leave. So that's a little bit about the ways that you can interact with external parties outside your organization, as well as the telephony like features. We're gonna review the call button here and I'm gonna go through this one kind of fast because we need to keep pace here. Um, over here, you'll recognize familiar phone-like features or telephone-like features. So you have a speed dial that you can create and pin out folks up top here. So if I wanted to go ahead and add the administrator to, right, to the speed dial, we can do that. Suggested contacts come in there, as well as other contacts that I recently interacted with. The contacts view that you see here will populate anything that's inside of your organization in Office 365. In addition to that, it will also populate any personal contacts you've saved. Lastly, uh, history is just, just that, a history of incoming and outgoing calls you've made and their durations, and then voicemail. So most people are, are saying, well, why do I need voicemail or I don't have a telephone system here inside of Teams. Why do I have voicemails? Well, folks inside your organization can leave you voicemails and then you'll receive an email with an attached audio file and the transcription of that voice message. And then of course you can play it here and view that transcription I described. Lastly, this make a call function down here, right now it's showing you a bunch of suggested contacts, but there's some expanded functionality that requires extra licensing that you could actually sign up for a Teams phone system. And that would give you the ability to actually make calls right from here with a dial pad. That's a quick and dirty overview, if you will, of a lot of information and I hope it's been helpful. One other thing that I'll point before I hand it back over to Jeff and we move back to the deck, it's just this little files tab. I mentioned it earlier and I said, hey, this has really been starting to evolve. And really this is just a view of your own files in your OneDrive or files that you have inside of your Teams spread across the things we just reviewed. That's gonna cover all of the Teams functionality. And there is one other feature that I'll just browse out to real, real quick and it's the Microsoft 365 roadmap. For me as a information technology professional, I like to keep up on what's going on and what's changing in Office 365. So this is a great place to kind of see what the feature rollouts are. You can go in here and sort by product. So we'll sort for teams. And then you can even go down a little bit and kind of understand, well, hey, you know, which of these am I? We're, the, we're in the worldwide instance here. These other things don't apply to most of our audience. And then from there, you can even go as far down as to the specific actual platform that you use. So um, that's it for, for this side for me. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate that overview and uh, the demo. That was great. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There are a few additional considerations that I would like to point to um, just as you begin to think about uh, what would it be like to implement Teams and um, what can you get started on quickly on your own. And, uh, and so Microsoft has, uh, as, as Adam mentioned, this kind of, they've used some interesting terminology, some very common words to describe things uh, within Teams. And so uh, one of those is this concept of, of creating groups. And so in some ways, I want to kind of give you a warning here um, that uh, within the Teams concept, there's groups. And then uh, Adam illustrated the, the channel concept. Uh, and this creates layers, if you will, of structure to how Teams works for your organization. And we're finding it's really important to get uh, a strategic plan together in order to uh, you know, have a strategy and a framework in mind before you start building and putting the bricks in place. Um, so terminology also complicates the matter uh, because when they talk about groups, 
Uh, there's actually a way to have your Office 365 predefined groups become a part of your Teams architecture, or you can create a brand new group uh, inside of Teams as, as Adam demonstrated. Uh, and so once again, it's really important to have a plan before you just take a you know, random start at uh, developing those structures um, within Teams. And so uh, there's a few other uh, new release things uh, that are coming up. Um, Adam mentioned the roadmap uh, website and uh, would recommend you keep an eye on that. Uh, in addition to that, a couple items I'll mention. Um, in the meetings, there's a new feature coming called Raise Your Hand, and that allows you to uh, raise your hand and indicate that you want, have, you know, want to take uh, control of the meeting for a moment. Um, and one of the really cool features for us as technology experts is this real-time noise suppression. Uh, Adam, you want to take a moment and just explain uh, what you guys have done already in experiencing the real-time noise suppression? Definitely. So it's funny, um, some of you may know Daniel Gilbert. He's, uh, he's in charge of all of us. He's my boss. Basically, anyone that's technical reports up to Daniel, and uh, he's a good friend. And him and I were getting his home set up ready to go the other night and we were doing some audio testing between teams and our soft phone that's included in our phone system and I tell you Daniel was using the same exact headset when we were testing and the funny thing is he has an overhead vent that he uses in his home workspace and with our telephone system soft app you could hear that fan running 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 when we use the exact same mic and headset inside of the Teams call, it actually suppressed that fan. So that's like a super awesome high-tech feature. And uh, that's, that's just one that we, we noticed right away here in the last couple of weeks. Great, thanks Adam. And so uh, I think now the best thing we should do is uh, with our time where it is, uh, is pivot out to uh, some questions. And uh, Eleni, what, uh, what, what have we heard from our audience? All right. Well, thank you, Adam and Jeff, for everything that you've shared. Um, as we expected, we do have quite a lot of questions. Adam, um, I'll let you take this one. When I schedule a meeting in Teams, how do I make sure that my Outlook calendar gets updated? Sure, great question. So the great thing about the integration behind the whole Microsoft 365 landscape is that they all work together. So anything that you schedule inside of Teams will show up in your Outlook calendar and vice versa. Outlook, if you schedule, it'll come right back to that Teams calendar view. So they all just work together. Great, thanks. Jeff, I'll let you take this one. Do you have any recommendations for meeting etiquette, especially with so many of us working from home right now? Wow, that's a good question. So uh, we've seen this already as we've been widely using Teams and we've adopted some best practices to try and, uh, you know, just to, to be, have good etiquette. Uh, good question. And so uh, part of it is uh, limiting distractions, right? So right now my office door is closed. Um, my cell phone is completely uh, uh, silenced. Uh, my desk set for the, tele for the telephone system in our office is on do not disturb. Um, and so that has really helped me to limit distractions for this meeting. I turned off all the sounds that were going to happen on my computer, uh, alerts and things like that. Um, you know, if you're having web cameras used, uh, uh, then, you know, dressing appropriately is a good idea or what the, you know, what it looks like uh, for the people that are watching uh, to pay some attention on that. Um, if there's a multiple people in the meeting, it's really helpful to mute the audio if you're not talking. And uh, that just really helps to keep things clean from an audio perspective. And uh, Jeremy did demo that uh, blurred background, uh, which also helps to uh, limit distractions from the room for those that are watching on screen. Perfect, thanks so much, Jeff. We'll let Adam take this one, either at the team level or at the channel level. Is there any way of having an always present or easily accessible display of team members and their in and out status? That's a really good question. So presence is something that, um, that's the technical term that we're talking about, presence. Um, and really presence is kind of tied to the do not disturb or away or busy function. Um, you'll notice that that presence feature actually recently got, um, got resources reallocated in, in Microsoft's 365 environment because of the load on their, on their servers. Um, but 
the best view that I've seen inside of the Teams application itself directly is really inside of the calls panel. The calls panel will show you the presence. And then in addition to that, on a person by person basis, you'll see their status when you're chatting with them. Inside of the team structure, because there's multiple parties reporting on that presence, you really can't see it there. Um, and then in terms of the membership pane that I previewed to you guys briefly in the web app, you will see some of those indicators of presence lit up there right now they're really just suppressed and then a couple of those other bells and whistles you'll see really inside of the uh the the actual full-blown application but unfortunately there isn't like an in out board or you know whether folks are in um it does honor schedule so what i mean by that is if you actually have a scheduled meeting on your calendar, it will show you as read or unavailable. And so that's great. Um, I think that covers the question there. Thanks, Adam. We have tons of questions, so we're going to try to get to as many as we can. Next, can you archive channels when you're no longer used, but you do not want to delete the information? Wow, that's a really good question. So um, there is a function inside of the system to archive them. But that really, when it comes to archiving data in Teams, it really extends to a good backup program. And honestly, um, really the Office 365 backup solutions we're seeing are really just starting to develop options for Teams. Um, we've been piloting and even putting our new customers on a newer backup product that adds Teams backup functionality so you could archive and restore a an entire channel um, but in terms of built-in archiving today as good as it really gets is to you know let your tenant administrator kind of remove membership and then it you know be be marked as a private channel thanks that um jeff i will um have you take this next one um how does a team's calendar relate to my outlook calendar and how would i use each one oh good yeah, that's excellent. The integration's really tight. So if you're in Outlook and you plan a Teams meeting, uh, it shows up in both, just as you would expect. And if you go into the Teams calendar view, you're seeing all of the uh, uh, items that are on your Outlook calendar. The both, both sides are fully synchronized. Okay, perfect. Uh, what if somebody does not have a calendar icon on the left? What does that mean? So, like I covered a little bit earlier, there's the these changes are constantly coming. So if you have a if you don't have a calendar icon on the the left, you may see an icon that says meeting. And that just means that your tenant may be using a slightly older version of the team's experience. Um, those kinds of things are rolled out in phases. And so really we're at Microsoft's discretion in terms of when to move those forward. There are some controls we can ask for, but if you're still seeing something that says meeting rather than calendar, your team's tenant functionality hasn't been upgraded yet. All right, thanks Adam. I'm gonna let you take this one as well. And in fact, there's two related questions. One is, would this be a good alternative for GoToMeeting? And, and the other person asked, how come we didn't use GoTo, uh, why didn't we use Microsoft Teams today for this webinar? That's a really good question, and it, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it right back to Eleni because she's in charge of all this stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, the platforms were built for different purposes. Simply said, you know, go to go to webinar, go to meeting. They're really built for conferences first, right? And this is a webinar that we're in today, guys, not a meeting. That's really the thing to say. It's all about that intended use case. So go to webinar is built for webinars. That's why we're here delivering this webinar to you. It's the best way to run a webinar. Teams has a lot of feature parity, but it's not built first to do a webinar. It's built first as a collaboration and a meeting space for folks that are integrated in the Microsoft 365 landscape. I hope that answers the question. I think so. All right, I think we're going to end with questions there. A few others that we have, and we will try to reach out to you uh, with an answer to those. Again, we did want to share just some next steps that you can take. 
If you are a current client and would like to get some help with Microsoft Teams implementation, please email us at support at kitetechgroup.com. For those of you that are not currently working with us but would like to learn more about our IT or consulting services, please reach out to us by emailing at either engage at kitetechgroup.com or you can visit our website to learn more or complete a contact form there. We would be really happy to set up a complimentary consultation and just talk with you about your technology needs. On Monday, we will be sending out a follow-up email that will include additional Microsoft Teams resources, as well as the link to today's recording. In that email, you'll also have an opportunity to register for our next webinar coming up on May 12th, which will be focused on developing an effective security awareness program. With everything going on right now, keeping security top of mind and making sure to educate everyone in your organization to be alert and aware is more important than ever. So we would encourage you to sign up for that one. So we hope you found the information that we share today valuable. We appreciate you spending your time with us today and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Take care.